lectures, I want to talk about the papacy, the Pope, where the Pope comes from. We talked in the last lecture about the importance of knowing about Rome for understanding what's happening in North Africa and in Carthage. And one of the important historical developments in the Roman Church is the power of the Bishop of Rome, who eventually comes to be called the Pope. Well, where does this come from? How does it happen? And when does it happen? These are important questions so that when we begin studying the history of Carthage and we think about Rome, we understand what is happening, but in some cases, just as importantly, what is not happening in Rome. When does the bishop in Rome become the pope as we think of him? There's a common idea that this happens very early on. In fact, many people in the Catholic tradition are told that this happens immediately with Peter. But historically, we see a different picture. So when does Rome begin to have some kind of special influence, and how does that happen? And we're going to set this up tonight in, this, in these next two lectures, but this will have implications for the study of the bishops of Carthage as well. So let's talk about the rise of the papacy. And let me start with the definition. So what or who is the pope? And very specifically, the Pope, as it's understood now, is the Bishop of Rome. That's, structurally speaking, who the Pope is or what the Pope is. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome. So the Pope is, not some, is really not someone who's outside the normal church hierarchy. The Pope is someone who's within the normal church hierarchy, but over the course of history has been given some special authority. There's also the belief, very strongly in the Roman Catholic tradition, that the Pope is the successor to Peter. That the Pope, who now exists now, stands in a long line of Popes who go all the way back to Peter. And as many people know, this has to do with an interpretation of a passage in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus has an exchange with Peter, and as a result of this, many people think, Peter's given some special authority that is then handed down throughout the history of the church. <clears throat> so now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Here's the key passage. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the first thing that Jesus does here is he gives Peter really a nickname. There's a, there's a play on words here. Because the name Peter in Greek is Petros. And the Greek word for rock is Petros. So he says, I tell you, you are Petros. You are rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Um, when I grew up, there was a series of films starring Sylvester Stallone called Rocky. So this is Jesus saying, I'm going to call you Rocky. Or there's now a professional wrestler who's an actor called The Rock. So this is the name that Jesus is giving him. Your name means rock, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. Now, does he mean he's building the church on Peter? Or does he mean he's building the church on what Peter has said? This is one of the debates in the history of Christianity. And he says, I'll give you the gate, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. So as this process develops later on, the understanding keeps, it comes to be that at this time, Jesus tells Peter, you are special. You are special from all the other apostles, all the other disciples at this point. You're special. And I'm giving you the authority, really, to the gates of heaven. You have the authority to open or close the gates of heaven. But that's not the understanding in the early period, as far as we can tell. 
And we're, we're going to talk about that in a little more detail. Now, in the development of the idea of the Pope, there was also some political element to this. Because in the early centuries of Christianity, Rome was the capital, some people thought, well, the political capital makes sense that there would also be the church capital. The capital of the empire, Rome, it might make sense that that's also the capital of the church. And some of the Roman bishops, beginning in the second or especially the third and fourth centuries, begin to refer to themselves as the bishop of bishops. That is, they seem to begin to take on the understanding that there's something special about their role over other bishops. The bishop of bishops, or the greatest bishop would be another way to say that. So those who say the Pope has existed since the time of Peter, they would, this is the, the, the line of argument. Jesus installed Peter as the first pope. He was the, cap he was the pope in Rome, the capital of the empire, which is also the capital of the church. And therefore, the bishops who come after him in his line, they are the greatest of all the bishops. Now, speaking historically, however, there seems to be evidence to the contrary. So I want to talk about a few pieces of evidence against the idea that the bishop of Rome from the earliest days was the bishop of bishops, or was the greatest bishop, or had some kind of special authority. And I'm not trying to be polemical against Roman Catholicism. I'm just trying to speak very historically. What do the early church sources suggest to us about the way the Romans talked about themselves and the way that other people talked about the Bishop of Rome? A very important early church document is known as First Clement. It's written around the end of the first century, perhaps around 95, between 95 and 100. This is a letter written from the church in Rome to the church in Corinth. And the circumstances seem to be that in Corinth, some young men have risen up and rebelled against the elders. The young men have risen up against the older men, and they're trying to overthrow them and take control of the church. And the Church of Rome is writing to them to, to correct this problem. The letter begins, the Church of God, which sojourns at Rome, which resides at Rome. To the Church of God, sojourning or residing at Corinth. To those who are called and sanctified by the will of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from Almighty God through Jesus Christ be multiplied. This is the opening of the letter. Notice what we don't see. We don't see a letter being written by a single person, by a single bishop. We don't see a claim to having special authority over Corinth. We don't see, we as Rome are telling you, Corinth, what you should do. <clears throat> now the letter is called First Clement because in later church tradition, it was believed that a follower of Peter named Clement was the, was the bishop at this time. So it, this letter came to be credited to Clement, and so it's called First Clement. And the idea is he was the Bishop of Rome, writing to Corinth to tell them what to do. But that's not what the letter says. The letter indicates it's being sent by a group of leaders in Rome to a group of leaders in Corinth. This suggests to us that in this early period, there's not a single Bishop of Bishops who's writing as one person telling other churches what they should or should not do. Another form of evidence comes from the writings of Ignatius the Bishop of Antioch in Syria. So in the early part of the second century, maybe around the year 110, Ignatius has been arrested in Antioch. He's being transported to Rome where he will eventually be killed as a martyr. And he writes a letter to the Roman church. So I want to look at how he introduces this letter. How does he address the Roman church? Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus. Theophorus is a name that means the bearer of God. To the church which has obtained mercy through the majesty of the Most High Father in Jesus Christ, his, his only begotten Son, the church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of him that wills all things, which are according to the love of Jesus Christ our God, which also presides in the place of the report of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of the highest happiness, worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining 
her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy, and which presides over love, is named from Christ and from the Father, which I also salute in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. It's a very long opening, much longer than we would typically put in a letter. And he has wonderful things to say about the church in Rome. But he doesn't address a bishop as if there's a single bishop who has the authority over the church. And what does he say? He says, the church presides in the place of the report of the Romans. So he recognizes this church has authority among the Romans. I'm writing to you, a beloved church, you have authority over the Romans. There's no indication here that Ignatius thinks the Roman church has authority over anyone else. There's no indication here that Ignatius, who was a very strong bishop and had a very strong idea about what the bishop should do and about the authority of the bishop, he was a strong bishop, but he doesn't talk as if there's a strong bishop in Rome who controls everything. He's one of the apostolic fathers, right? Yes, Ignatius is one of the, the church fathers, yes. Apostolic fathers. Apostolic fathers, yes. The tradition is that either he, he may have followed John or Paul. Yes, there's some possible connection to the apostles, yes. The argument that the spirit which, which presides over love, which means that uh, it's presiding over other churches. Yes, yeah, so the question is this phrase, which presides over love, does this mean that they preside over other churches? If this is what Ignatius means, he's very, very, very secretive about it. Because it's, uh, it's, so if he thinks I'm writing to Rome, to a particular bishop who's important. He should have addressed a, a specific bishop. So the question is, should he have addressed a, a specific bishop? So let's look at his letter to Polycarp. Ignatius, who was called Theophorus again, to Polycarp, bishop of the church of the Smyrnians, bishop of Smyrna, or rather, who has as his own bishop God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish you an abundance of happiness. In this case, Ignatius is writing to a particular bishop. He's recognizing the authority of that bishop in Smyrna. If there is a very strong bishop in Rome who has the sole authority over the Romans, why does Ignatius not address that bishop the way that he does Polycarp? We can't speak definitively about this, but this suggests to us that Ignatius does not see in Rome a single bishop who has the control over all of Rome, let alone the control of everyone else. A few more pieces of evidence. This is a little bit later, but this comes into our period in the course. In the year 254, we have a letter from the Bishop Cyprian of Carthage. He tells us about an event that happens. There were two bishops in Spain who had been basically removed from office because of inappropriate behavior. They had violated some element of church law and they had been removed from office. These two Spanish bishops went to Rome and talked to Stephen, the bishop in Rome at that time, and Stephen reinstated them as bishops in Spain. These are two bishops from Spain who went to Rome and Stephen of Rome said, yes, you, you, you can still be the bishop. He sends them back to Spain. <clears throat> now, if the bishop of Rome is the single authority in the church, that should be the end of the issue. But it's not the end of the issue. What happens is the Spanish churches then write to Cyprian in Carthage. They basically appeal the decision of Rome to Carthage and they ask Cyprian to intervene on their behalf. And Cyprian writes a letter about this. But then, sorry, but that does give the impression that in Rome the assumption was that they did have more to say. This, so the question is, does this show that in Rome they feel they do have more to say? Stephen does seem to feel that he has some special authority that he can speak about Spain, yes. So how does Carthage react? Right? Cyprian does not agree with this. Cyprian writes a letter and he talks about, he mentions one of these, these bishops, Basilides is one of the bishops, went to Rome and deceived Stephen, our colleague, residing at a distance and ignorant of what had been done and of the real truth. Stephen, the bishop of Rome, Cyprian says, 
was far away from the events. And it was ignorant of what had been done. Stephen didn't know what had happened. He was too far away. So in the theology that develops of the Pope, the Pope can never make a mistake. The Pope has the full authority. But Cyprian is here saying, because Stephen was far away and he didn't have all the information, Stephen made a mistake. So here you have the, the Bishop of Carthage explicitly disagreeing with the Bishop of Rome on an issue. We don't know how this turned out, but we clearly see that as far as Africa was concerned, just because Rome said it did not mean that that was it. You could still have an alternative perspective. And one final issue in this first part, talking about the development of the papacy. If the, if the Pope is the single successor in the line of Peter, there should always only be one single successor in the line of Peter. If the Pope has special authority, then one would think that there would only ever be one. But multiple times in the first few centuries within Rome, there are several people who claim to be the Bishop of Rome. There are rivalries over who is the rightful Bishop of Rome, which would mean there are rivalries over who is the one true Bishop. So two examples. In the third century, there is a Bishop in Rome named Callistus, but there is an alternative Bishop in Rome named Hippolytus. Uh, in later church tradition, Hippolytus was condemned by some as an anti-pope. But here you have a period of about five years where there are two different people both claiming to be the Bishop of Rome. If God had set in place a system where there would only ever be one successor of Peter, how do we have two different successors of Peter? And then again, later in that same century, two different rivals, one named Cornelius, and one named Novation, rivals to be the Bishop of Rome. Now, some of this evidence we speak, what we call speaking from silence. We're trying to connect the dots without all the evidence that we would like. But if we want to say the, the Bishop of Rome was always the most important bishop, if we want to say that, we, we would have to explain this evidence. This evidence suggests to me as an historian that it's not clear in the early church that the Bishop of Rome was the Bishop of Bishops. At times, he may have exercised authority, and maybe some of these bishops did think they were special, but did everyone understand that was happening or not? And in the early centuries, the evidence suggests that the Bishop of Rome was very important, but not the single leader in the West. And so in our next lecture, we're gonna talk about then how does the idea of the papacy develop. How does one get from this early evidence which suggests different models to the model of a single bishop who has all of that authority? We'll talk about in the next lecture what brings that about. Let me pause here though and ask for questions about this first part. Yes? Yeah, so the question is about Tertullian and his reference to the authority of Roman bishops. He certainly, everyone recognizes that the Roman bishop has authority. And certainly Irenaeus also talks about this, that the Roman church has some authority. I think there's, the question is, is that the same as saying the bishop of Rome has all the authority? And in Tertullian's case, we know that he writes things that the bishop of Rome doesn't like. So it's, it's unclear that Tertullian is saying, it's unclear to me if Tertullian is saying, yes, the Bishop of Rome has all the authority. I think he's recognizing the Roman church is very important, but I don't think he's giving all of the authority to the Roman bishop in this period. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about the economic part of this, the, the giving out of benefits and how the economic power relates to ecclesiastical power. And that's, we're going to talk about that actually in the next lecture, is not just church issues, but political issues that also lead into the development of the papacy.